Evening, Lomax. How are you doing? This is Pastor Mark Green uh, coming to you from uh, our weekly Bible study. I'm so glad that you decided to tune in with us. I know that we are not live, but that does not mean that we can't have a, a pretty good Bible study. Um, we, are, we are going to uh, go right into our lesson for tonight. Um, before we get started in the lesson, um, I'm just going to ask that uh, we have a word of prayer because if we have a word of prayer, I think it'll, it'll steady the ship and it'll get us prepared for Bible study. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come to thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you do. Uh, we ask you now that you be with us, uh, lead us and guide us in this study, that what we say and what we do uh, would be pleasing in your sight. And also we ask that whatever words are said tonight that we can take them and apply them to our lives, that we might become better as the result. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, again, again, I want you, I want you to go with me to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, and I want to go all the way to verse 25. Um, Acts chapter 16, verse 25. I've been looking at this for a couple of weeks, and um, I think we can pull some maybe some nuggets out of here tonight that I believe will, will encourage us along the way because this is midweek is hump day and uh, we all just need a little encouragement. I don't know about you, but just a little encouragement goes a long way. It's like a good shot of coffee. Um, once I have a good shot of encouragement, I can make it, um, make it through the rest of the week. I know it's Thursday, but it still feels like Wednesday to me. Amen. Okay. So, <laughs> so let me, uh, let's, let's get right into it. The book of Acts, uh, chapter 16, uh, we're going we're gonna to study verses 25 through 34 tonight. And we're going to talk about, um, it, it, it's referred to a lot of times as the Macedonia call. Um, this is where it's an end time cry for the lost. Um, the apostle Paul had a vision uh, at night and a, a man of Macedonia prayed and, and asked him to come over to Macedonia and help them. And this is found in Acts chapter 16 and 9. He says, come over to help us. Um, from this, we get the, the, the principle that when there is a Macedonia call, there's an urgent need to help save the lost. Okay? There's an urgent need to help save the lost. So I want you to put that in the back of your minds as we go through this uh, lesson tonight. And it it is, um, I think it, it's gonna it's gonna bless you a little bit. Um, what we first find, is, and we'll look at, we'll examine a little bit. We'll break this these verses down a little bit. We'll we'll break down. And I know I said twenty five through thirty four, but we'll start at verse sixteen. So I'm not gonna. I, I said twenty five, but I really meant sixteen. So we're gonna start at sixteen because I think that's important. So verses, we'll start at verses 16, 16 and 18. We'll break that down a little bit and then we'll break it down in sections, okay? I think it's easier to, to, um, to divide if we break it down in sections. So verses 16 through 18 of chapter uh, 16 of Acts. So that's Acts chapter 16. And now if you have any questions, I know there are some of you who are on, uh, who are uh, coming in to us on Zoom. So if you have any questions, just holler out, you know, um, take yourself off mute and, um, and chime in, okay? So verses 16 uh, say, it starts by saying, now it happened as he went, as we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. So, so we start off by, by Paul in his in his group being followed by a woman who had a spirit of divination. Divination is fortune telling, and it's of course um, in our Bible study during uh, Halloween we talked about divination was one of those things that was forbidden. It's for future telling by signs and omens, and it's found if you want to look more about it, it's found in Deuteronomy 18 and it's found in Leviticus 19. 
but is when someone is possessed with a spirit for the purpose of foretelling through signs and omens. So this the servant, the slave girl, was possessed by spirit, and her masters made a profit off of her gift of foretelling or future telling or divination. And she went around following Paul and his group, and she was saying, um, and she was calling them out. She said, these are servants of the Most High God. And she says, they proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she did this for many days. I think that it's important for us to note out that even the evil spirits know who we are. And they know, and they know who Paul, they knew Paul. Um, they knew who Paul was. Uh, they knew his, uh, what he was there to do. Um, they said, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. So at some point, the, the spirits know us, and, and, and I don't want to get in, this is not a Bible study lesson about spirits, but it's important for us to understand that we are known. When we are children of God, we are known. Um, I am reminded of, and I'm going to look it up here since we've talked about this. This is in, um, let me see, this is the, what's that? Mark and twenty four. Mark and twenty four. Don't look at this right. Okay. Um, Jesus cast out an unclean spirit. In Mark 1 and 24. And uh, there was a certain man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit uh, and cried out, saying, Let us alone. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, Holy One of God. So the Spirit gives discernment. The they know who we are. They, they absolutely know uh, who we are. And we can take that any kind of way we want to. I think a lot of us, um, we, But it's important for us to know that. So they, the spirit in the girl who had divination, knew Paul and his group, and that's that's important. Um, what else can we learn from this? Let's see here. Um, Paul cast the spirit out. Um, Paul cast the spirit out um, by the name of Jesus Christ. He cast the spirit out. And it said uh, in that very hour, that spirit of divination came out of that little girl. And as a result, the, the masters of that little girl, and this, was, this, uh, this is in verses 19 through 24. We'll go a little further and read here because I'm going to get to the meat of, of what we want to deal with tonight. So in 1924, 19 through 24, uh, it says, but when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. They teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrate tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. So the people along of the people complained um, that Paul and Silas uh, were, were causing trouble in the city. Um, why were they causing trouble in the city? They were preaching and teaching Jesus Christ, teaching customs which are not lawful for us. That's what the magistrate said. Um, so if you can picture um, Paul casting out this spirit, if you can picture in your mind that this, this slave girl no longer has this gift that, uh, that was profitable to her masters, um, the master's getting upset now blaming Paul and Silas uh, for their lost wages, uh, go to the magistrates, and then they start 
complaining and they they rile the crowd up and say, you know, these people have lost us our 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 livelihood and you need to do something about it. And they are teaching and preaching and doing things that are not lawful in our city. And they got to they they rile the people up to such a degree that they were beaten and then thrown into prison. Now um what does this have to do with the Macedonian call? It's, it's, that was my thought. Okay, so the Spirit led Paul and his group to go preach. It was an urgent call for salvation. But when they get there, they encounter uh, they encounter conflict. They encounter uh, this 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 girl with the spirit of divination, and then they encounter a hostile crowd, and then they encounter being beaten and then being thrown into prison. What does all this have to do with the Macedonian call? What, what does this have to do with this urgent call to be saved, some, for someone to be saved? Let, let me say this. Oftentimes, our calling or the call for us to, to, to share the gospel or to share a word with someone is not paved with um, pleasantries. I think that's one of the things we can take from here. Um, God never promised us that people would receive us everywhere we went. And just because we carry this message of hope doesn't mean that everyone will receive us, okay? Everyone's not going to be happy to see us. Uh, we, will, um, we will upset the status quo. Uh, people will not like what we say. People will not like the message that we bring. And, but this is an urgent call for people to be saved. And in that urgent call, you will count, you will encounter some conflict. You will encounter some insurgents. You will encounter people who will be against you. Um, not everyone will receive you. Um, and we are of that time, and I don't know if you recognize it, but we are in an age now where a lot of us are not being received. Have you ever just, you know, when people find out that you're a Christian, they treat you different. Um, they have some some hostilities towards you, um, maybe some one point in time you were okay, but now uh, they, they receive you different. Um, we're in an age now where being, uh, being a believer is not that popular. And, and I think we need to understand that. I think we need to understand the times in which we live. And this kind of gives us some understanding that the relevance is, is that when we go somewhere, as an ambassador of Christ, we won't always be received warmly. And that's the relevance of this. And I think for us to have any preconceived notion that just because we're child of God and we mean all the best things for people and we're preaching Christ or we're living Christ and we're trying to be a good example, that somehow people are going to just receive us with open arms and they're going to love on us and they're going to make us feel good about ourselves. I think that's, I think that is, uh, that is, um, we, we shouldn't have those kind of thoughts. I think to, to be able to say that uh, we're going to be received is, um, is an error on our part, okay? It's going to be an error on our part. So, so they, were, they were beaten, uh, and then they were cast in prison. Okay. Now, this is where I believe um, they were meant to be all along. Uh, man, that says a lot right there. I believe they were meant to be in prison. I believe they were meant. I believe, I believe they were led to Macedonia to be in prison for the purpose of someone being saved. And not just someone, but, but someone's whole house. Can you imagine God sending you to a place where you're not received? Can you imagine God sending you to a place where you'll have to suffer some hardship in order for someone else to be saved. I think that's foreign to a lot of us. We, we don't understand what it means to go to places and be saved or, or go into places that are hostile to us in order to, uh, for the greater good. Let me say that, for the greater good. So, so after they've been arrested, they've been thrown into the inner prison, their feet have been um, shackled with the fastening stocks, is what the text says. <coughs> um, we'll, go, we'll go to verse 25 through 28. It says, but at midnight, 
Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So in the midst of their suffering, they begin to praise and worship God. In the midst of them being in prison, they begin to, to worship and they begin to sing and they begin to lift up their voices to God. <clears throat> I, can, I can say this, and it says, but at midnight, at their darkest hour, it's meant to symbolize at their darkest hour, um, a dark, uh, dirty, nasty, um, uh, disease-filled prison filled with people. Um, they were chained together. Um, and in that place, Paul and Silas begin praising God, singing and praying. And all of the prisoners heard their praise. All the prisoners heard them praying and singing in worshiping God. This was this was worship in the midnight hour. Worship at your lowest point. We have to ask ourselves, what, what do we do at our lowest points when we find ourselves in conditions that are um un, that are um, unpleasant? At our lowest point, can we find a song in our heart? Can we find a way to sing and pray and, and praise God? that when things appear to be at their darkest, can we find um, can we find a way to lift up our voices and sing praises unto God? Now, again, I say at any time you guys want to chime in, if you want to say something that's good. If you don't, uh, you can just listen to me. Um, but the prisoners were listening to Paul and Silas' praise. And that praise and worship brought about a praise break, brought about a prison break, okay? Their praise break brought about a prison break. So, so when we read verse 26, it says, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so the, that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. A miracle in the midst of their praise, a miracle, um, miraculous, um, an earthquake. Uh, the prison was shaken. Uh, the doors were opened, uh, and everyone's chains were loosened. God was going to do a midnight uh, jailbreak for Paul and Silas and all of the prisoners. Everyone's, everyone was about to uh, break free from this prison. Everyone was. And the keeper of the prison, and this this is something that, that I found interesting, and this you find this also in Scripture in the New Testament, that when, when, uh, when guards have been given the responsibility of watching over prisoners, if the prisoners escape, the guards often forfeit their lives. So um, the keeper of the prison, this is in verse 27, awaking from sleep, seeing that the prison doors were open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he knew the consequences of allowing prisoners to escape because he had been given that responsibility. And they put him in charge and they uh, and they laid them in the inner prison and they make sure they were locked. So he understood the responsibility that he was in charge of these prisons. If something happened to the prisoners, then he would be responsible and he would probably forfeit his life. So instead of going through that, he was about to draw his sword and commit suicide. And that's what the Bible says. He says when he saw that the, that the doors are open and he supposed that the prisoners were gone, he, he saw no other way because he, he knew for sure that he was going to be tortured and probably killed. So he pulled out his sword and said, it's just better for me to die. And just as he was about to strike himself down, Paul yelled out with a loud voice and said, do not harm yourself for we are all here. Okay. So Paul prevented, this is in verse 28, Paul prevented it. Um, in verse 28, Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself for we are all here. Now get this. Um, then he called for a light ran in, fell down, trembling before fall, Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So the guard, seeing this move of God, believing that Paul and Silas were, were, were messengers of God, servants of God, as I'm sure the guard heard when that servant girl with the spirit of divination was talking. So see, it was not 
it was not something that was unknown to him who Paul and Silas were. So when he saw, when he experienced the miracle and he saw what happened, he he had a he had this this epiphany. He I, I, I need what they have. And he said, What must I do to be saved? Now, this is where Paul and Silas were supposed to be. They went through all of that that this prison guard could be saved. What are we willing to go through for someone to be saved? What, what type of uncomfort are we willing to bear for someone to be saved? What are we willing to endure for someone to be saved? How are we willing to be used for someone to be saved? And that's really what we need to be asking ourselves. How can we be used as a vessel so someone can see God in our lives and say, what must I do to be saved? This is where this man was. When he saw the miracle, he knew who Paul and Silas were, and he saw that God had moved in such a powerful way. He said, what can I do to be saved? This is the Macedonian call. This is the urgent call for salvation. This is, this is what makes it um, challenging for a lot of believers today. We don't want to inconvenience ourselves. We don't want to make our lives uncomfortable. We want our lives to be at ease. And what I'm saying is we don't have to live a life of perpetual um, uh, perpetual um, uh, misery and woe. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is, is that God calls us out of a place of comfort for the purpose of someone else being saved. Our mission, our goal, we are instruments of his, of his purpose. And his purpose is that none be lost. And I think that's where a lot of us, are, you know, we, we get caught up in our own purpose, what God is going to do with my life and, what I'm all, and how my life is going to turn out. And what it, your life is tied to God's purpose. And if God's purpose is for you to go to this one little place, so somebody else can see God in you, so you can be saved. That might be your whole life. That might be your whole, your whole purpose. And, and someone said, what if that is a place of uncomfort and causes us to be abused? When you say it causes us to be abused, uh, is, it, is it physical abuse, mental abuse, verbal abuse? It could be all three. Let me say this, but we have to be sure that God is calling us into that purpose. It, it doesn't. It doesn't benefit us. It doesn't benefit the kingdom if we are if we are called if we are not called to a place and we suffer. He said, "What good is it to suffer, and 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 for 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 unrighteousness? You know, don't don't can." Don't confuse or don't uh, mistake um, suffering for God's purpose to be um, um, to be we're just needlessly taking abuse. That's 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 not what I mean when I say that. He will call call us to go to places where we are uh, uncomfortable, but we'll know what the call is. We'll know what the call is. Paul knew right then. He told the guard, don't harm yourself. Maybe Paul had insight into why he was there in that, in that Philippian jail to save that jailer. Maybe he knew. Maybe he didn't. Maybe God didn't reveal the whole purpose to him. Maybe God just said, you know, you're going to go to jail. Maybe, maybe he didn't reveal it to him. Maybe he said, you just go to Macedonia and I will show you what's going to happen to you. But Paul did know this. <clears throat> he was being sent by God. And let me say this, if God sends you to a place, God will make provision for you. It may not always be comfortable, may not always be comfortable, but God will always make provision for his people because he will make provision for his purpose. Not our purpose, but his purpose. So when when we're called to places where we are not always received and when we are in places of being uncomfortable, 
uh, and we know that God sent us there, then we have to fall back on this notion that I'm being sent here for a reason. I'm being sent here for, I'm on divine assignment from God. That's why I'm here. And when we own divine assignment from God, God gives us strength to go through things maybe we normally wouldn't go through or couldn't go through. So here we go. He came to Paul and Silas and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your whole household. So not only was the jailer saved, but his whole house was saved. That was his wife and his kids. If he had servants, his servants would have been saved. Everybody in his house, if he had his, his mother, his mother-in-law living there, everybody who lived under his roof would have been saved that night. That was the purpose. The urgent call to salvation supersedes our comfort. And that's a hard pill to swallow oftentimes. And you won't see it often until after you, you, you see the hand of God move. You'll be like, oh, that's why God sent me here. You won't see it until after. Oh, this is why I was called to do this. You won't see it until after he's already moved. He moved on people's hearts, changed people's lives, and you were an instrument of that change. Then you say, oh, that's why I went through what I went through. I went through so God could use me so I could be, I could be the vessel that he would use to help bring these people into the kingdom. What job could be more? What what job could be more important than bringing others into the kingdom? Tell me. No job could be more. None. Not 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 one job could be more important than bringing people into the kingdom of God. So this is this is what Paul and Silas were have been called to do. This was this was the reason for the vision that they had been called. <clears throat> And you don't, and we don't know the ripple effects of that Philippian jailer and all his household being, being saved. We don't know who that family touched. We don't know what message was proclaimed. The Bible does not give us any insight on what they did uh, as a result of their of their salvation. So you don't know the ripples of of your actions. You don't you don't know if just this one person. Um, because I, let me let me say this: <clears throat> a story is told of a man. He was a missionary, um, and he didn't think he was very successful. And I'll let you go after this one. Um, he was he wasn't very successful. He didn't think he was. He went to Africa, and uh, he went he went all over the continent of Africa, um, and he preached and he taught. And but the numbers of people who came to Jesus under his ministry. Were, were not vast um, by comparison to other people. There were not there were not a whole lot of people who came to Jesus as a result of his missionary work. And he was and he was discouraged that at the end of his missionary trip when he left Africa, he was discouraged because he said, "Man, I didn't, I didn't." He thought you know he thought thousands would, would come, and 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 he I don't even think I don't even think hundreds came. And, and he was discouraged because he said, you know, I, I wasn't effective. I went over there and very few people came uh, to Christ and I felt like I was a failure. Well, he received a letter years later from one man who, uh, who was saved under his ministry and, and come to discover that this one man who came from under his ministry had brought salvation to thousands and thousands and thousands of people in Africa. His his ministry was known throughout the continent of Africa because he was so successful at doing missions work in Africa. And people were coming in droves to Christ. And he sent this man a letter and said, you just don't know what kind of impact you had on my life. And I just want to thank you for having this impact in my life. And it's because of you and your preaching and your relationship that I am able to reach all of these souls for Christ. And at that point, he realized that his job was not to reach 
hundreds of thousands of people. His job was just to reach the one. And that one was to give rise to, to, to hundreds of thousands of people. He realized that it wasn't about, uh, about all of these numbers, but he had a part to play in that. And he realized that he shouldn't have been complaining about, you know, man, I didn't think I was successful. And what I'm saying is you don't know who you're touching. You don't know what kind of impact. You don't know what that person is going to do, who you come into contact with, who you've mentored, who you've, who you've discipled. You don't know what kind of impact that person is going to make on the world. So you can't say because you haven't, um, you haven't led a whole lot of people or you think your ministry is ineffective because you don't see the numbers and you don't see your name in lights and all that. You, you just don't know what kind of impact your ministry is going to have. And I say that because Paul and Silas went through all of that for a, for a jailer in his house to be saved. And they took care of him. He said that same hour, um, and he took he took them same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And maybe he and all his family were baptized. Then he brought them into his house. He set food before them, and he re, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. So they they worshiped God. They worshiped. They sang praises unto God. The whole household. And I hope I painting an image in your mind that this person was not saved before and now he's saved and his whole household saved imagine the energy and the electricity in that house now imagine what the what the songs are like imagine the emotion of what what it's like to now receive salvation for the first time this is this is this is the importance and I guess I want to say in all of this, let me say this, your ministry matters. Your ministry matters. You may not be called to preach great sermons in great halls. You may not be called to sing uh, wonderful hymns in front of um, thousands of people. But whatever God has called you to do, whatever purpose he has for you, your ministry matters. Your ministry matters. And, and take your ministry to heart. Take it serious. Whatever God has placed in your hands, it's important. That's what I'm going to share. It's important. And Paul and Silas endured all of that for this one family. To be saved. So be encouraged. Be encouraged. Be encouraged knowing that if God has, has given you a ministry, it's important. It is important to the kingdom. And all of us have a ministry. We just got to discover what it is. And it's not always tied up inside of the church. A lot of times it's tied up outside the church. We come to church to get filled up and then we go to complete our ministry outside the walls of the church. So, so I want you to be encouraged. I want you to know that God is still on your side. I want you to know your ministry matters. I want you to know that oftentimes you'll go through times of uncomfort. You'll, you'll be in places where you won't, you won't understand why God places you here and you won't, and you'll be like, Lord, why did you allow this to happen to me? And you won't be able to see it until you come out on the other side. Until you've been delivered, until you see the fruits of your labors, then you go, oh, okay, that's why he sent me here. That's why he sent me to Logan Max. That's why he sent me here. So I could help this one person um, uh, come to Christ. So I could mentor this one young woman or this one young man. That's why he brought me here. And that's important to the kingdom. That's important. To, that is very important to the kingdom. Now, so, so I said all that. Any, any closing comments? Any closing comments? Any, any last words? Any insight that you can give me before we come out of here tonight? It, if, if you have any, um, you can share them in the chat um, when we post this on Facebook and, and YouTube. If you have any comments or any insight or any stories that you have where you can see this in your own life, I'd love to see them. I'd love to hear them where you didn't know why God placed you in a place and it wasn't comfortable for you and you didn't understand why. And then after you had completed the assignment the Lord revealed to you, that was the reason he sent you there.
So if, if you have stories like that, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear from you. Love to hear from you. Any questions, any comments, y'all? Any questions, any comments? Your ministry matters. I want you to know your ministry matters. Your ministry matters. And everyone has a ministry. Everyone has a ministry, okay? Every single person has a ministry. And whatever your ministry is, it matters to the kingdom. Amen. Um, if there are no comments, um, no questions, I'm going to close us out. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this uh, opportunity for us to be together. I thank you for uh, this lesson. I thank you for uh, any type of uh, revelation that you give us in our lives. Thank you for reminding us that our ministry matters and that oftentimes our, our level of discomfort uh, is no indication that you are not using us for your kingdom. Father, thank you for those who come out tonight. I thank you for those who will watch. I pray that your word will find good ground. I pray that you will uh, encourage the believers to continue on in the work that you've assigned to them. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen, y'all. Amen, amen. I pray God's blessings on you. Pray for our church. We'll be in church on Sunday. Praise God. Um, time will be going back. Uh, so don't be late. Don't be late. Don't be late. If you're going to be late, you get an extra hour of sleep. So don't be late on Sunday. Amen. Um, so take care. Be blessed. And I will see you guys on Sunday.